Charles Dickens, Best Ghost Stories, published by Woodsworth Classics. So this is an anthology book. It contains the following stories in the following order. The Queer Chair, A Madman's Manuscript, The Goblins Who Stole a Sexton, The Ghosts of the Mail, The Baron of Grodswig, a Christmas Carol, The Haunted Man in the Ghost's Bargain, To Be Read at Dusk, The Ghost in the Bride's Chamber, The Haunted House, Trial for Murder, and The Signal Man. I'll uh, try and remember to put all of those names in the description down below, but uh, these are the stories contained in this anthology. I stumbled upon this anthology by accident while just kind of browsing through a used bookstore. And uh, I was quite pleased with the find because I love a good ghost story. I mean, everybody loves a good ghost story, right? And I love Charles Dickens. I mean, everybody loves Charles Dickens, right? So I thought, okay, you get all the pleasure of Charles Dickens and all the pleasure of ghost stories. How could you possibly go wrong with that? Uh, so I bought the book, and after having read it, yeah, uh, it, it was a bit of a slog. Uh, I've decided that some of these lesser-known ghost stories by Charles Dickens are lesser-known for a reason. Now, it's a bit difficult to review a, an anthology. I mean, in, any anthology always has a problem that the books, sorry, the book is a collection of different stories and each story varies widely in, sorry, varies widely in purpose, style, and quality. Uh, and in fact, the publisher's introduction pretty much says as much. They, they use slightly different words than I do, but they say, quote, the quality of these 12 stories is inevitably uneven for they span virtually the whole of Dickens' creative lifetime, cover a variety of supernatural elements, and were written with varying intentions." So that's um, quoting from the publisher's introduction. Now, uh, some of these I really did actually enjoy. Uh, some of these I enjoyed a lot, and others I really struggled to finish. Like, I, I struggled to muster the concentration to focus to finish it because the prose was just, I felt like it was doing everything it could to push me away. Um, but l let me start maybe at the beginning here. Uh, the title is, in my opinion, slightly misleading. Because to me, when you say a ghost story, uh, it's more than a story with ghosts in it. I mean, I, I know literally that's what the meaning is. Um, but I think the connotations of a ghost story are some sort of scary, spooky story, something that sends a bit of chills down your spine, uh, and usually something with a surprise twist near the end. That, that's what I think of as ghost story. Uh, and that is not most of the stories in here. A lot of these are just morality tales with some supernatural elements. So not, not ghost stories in the sense of scary stories. And these morality tales do get a little bit repetitive when they're all collected in one volume. Uh, and most of these stories don't have any surprise twists at the end. It's, it's pretty much what you thought it would be based on the setup of the morality tale. And then, there's Dickens' famous long-winded prose. There are stories in this book that can take forever to get to the point. Now, depending on your patience as a reader, Dickens' long descriptions, uh, filled with various digressions and dry humor, are either the best thing about his writing or the most frustrating. I found it frustrating. Um, and before reading this, I considered myself a Dickens fan. Uh, although, admittedly, before reading this, I hadn't read a lot of Dickens. I, I had read Tale of Two Cities. I've actually re reviewed that book on this channel. Uh, and Tale of Two Cities was a book I read way back in high school, but uh, fell absolutely in love with. And it's been one of my, I've considered it one of my favorite books of all time ever since. Although, I do enjoy it more on audiobook 
than I do actually reading through it. I've, I've done it both ways. Uh, and when I'm reading through Dickens' prose, sometimes my eyes tend to glaze over. When I'm listening to the audiobook, the voice actor ha uh, helps me to get into the rhythm a little bit more of uh, Dickens' description and what he's trying to do, uh, if, if it's a good voice actor. Uh, and that's, I think, really the only Dickens book I've read straight through. I've, uh, in my youth, I read a lot of like uh, junior classics books that uh, made me familiar with the plot of uh, some of Dickens' more soap opera type novels like uh, David Copperfield and Oliver Twist. And, and I quite enjoyed that. So based on the strength of that and my experience with The Tale of Two Cities, I've considered myself a Charles Dickens fan. But <sighs> I've got to be honest, after reading through this book, I, I might have to admit my, to myself that I don't have the patience to read Dickens. E even back when I was in high school, I did note that his kind of long-winded prose was a little bit tiring. And, and I wrote that in the high school book report that I wrote on The Tale of Two Cities. And my high school teacher actually wrote in one of her marginal comments, she said, Dickens actually got paid, for, paid by the word, which is why his prose is so verbose. Now, it turns out, actually, with a little bit of internet research, that my high school teacher was wrong. Uh, this is like one of those famous uh, misconceptions or famous urban rumors about Dickens. He didn't actually get paid by the word. And, and I'll link to a website in the description down below that tries to set the record straight on this. He got paid by the installment. Now, of course, I mean, an, an installment is made up of words, so it's, it's not a complete, it's not com a complete falsehood. Um, but he didn't actually, he, nobody was actually counting his words. He got paid by the installment. Nevertheless, reading through some of the, these long, long descriptions that go on for like two pages sometimes, it is very easy to see where the rumor got started that he got paid by the word. I mean, like, if I didn't know better, I would totally think he got paid by the word af after reading through some of this. Uh, I've got a rather extended quotation uh, I picked out from the beginning of one of the books, but it's so long uh, that maybe I'll just save this for the end of the video rather than punish you at the beginning. But let's talk about what I enjoyed. Um, of, the, of the stories in this book, I enjoyed The Queer Chair, The Baron of Groswig, A Christmas Carol, To Be Read at Dusk, The Ghost in the Bride's Chamber, and Trial for Murder, and The Signal Man. Uh, long-winded descriptions aside, and some of these do have some long-winded descriptions, these were all worth the trouble in my opinion, uh, although for different reasons. The queer chair I quite like because of the humor in it, whereas the ghost in the bride's chamber is more of a traditional chilling ghost story tale. Uh, the other stories in this volume I had mixed feelings about, but that's to be expected in an anthology. Some of these are actually excerpts from larger works. Uh, so the first four stories, The Queer Chair, A Madman's Manuscript, The Goblins Who Stole Sexton, and The Ghost of the Mail, apparently all come from the Pickwick Papers, which is one of those books I've never actually read, although it's one of those classics that I've been meaning to get to someday. Um, it, you would never know that they come from the Pickwick Papers when you just read them in this anthology, because they appear to stand perfectly fine on their own. Um, but according to the publisher's introduction, uh, it was apparently Dickens' practice to insert smaller standalone stories into some of his longer seri serializations. So he, he did a few of those with the Pickwick Papers. Uh, the only place where the excerpt does not stand clearly on, on its own is The Haunted House, uh, the story number 10 in this anthology. Now, The Haunted House, as uh, it is talked about in the publisher's introduction, or you can look this up in Wikipedia, uh, is a collaboration between Charles Dickens and several other writers. Uh, a, a couple of these, them I actually recognize. Elizabeth Gaskell, 
who, uh, what did she write? Mary Barton, and um, I forget his name now. Uh, Culkins, uh, the guy who wrote the Moon uh, Shadow book, I don't remember. You, you can look it up on Wikipedia. It, it's a collaboration between Charles Dickens and several other well-known writers. Uh, like a couple of them are even well-known today. Um, which, which is interesting. I had no idea this existed. Uh, so apparently Dickens wrote the opening chapter and then other, they each got like a chapter to develop the story. It sounds like it might even be worth checking out on its own someday if I ever stumble across it in a bookstore. But in this anthology it is only presented the first chapter by Charles Dickens. Now, I guess if you're only going to include one chapter, you might as well include the first chapter because, it, it, you know, it's starting in at the ground level. Um, and it does a nice job of setting the story up, but then we never get to see how it's concluded uh, because then presumably the, the other writers uh, go on with that. And then, of course, uh, I don't know if you were paying attention earlier, but A Christmas Carol is number six in this book. The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, you, you know, the one that's been filmed and put on stage a million times, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, the, the, the famous Christmas Carol, which, like everybody else in the Western world, I had seen a million times before on various television and movie adaptations, but I had never actually read until now. So, so this is included in this anthology, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming that Probably most people are familiar with the story of The Christmas Carol, even if they may not have actually read Dickens' original tale, just because it's been filmed so much. I, I mean, if you think of The Christmas Carol, it does make sense why it would be in an anthology like this, kind of. Because there are ghosts. You know, there's three ghosts who come to visit Uncle Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge, in the night. Um, now, it's not like a scary ghost story, but then a lot of the stories in this anthology are not like scary ghost stories, so that's fairly typical. Excuse me. The, the more I talk, the thirstier I get. I went into this, uh, The Christmas Carol, expecting to not like it. Well, having mixed feelings about it. I, I, I On the one hand, I guess I did expect it, to be fairly good because it, it is a classic after all uh, and it's a very famous classic. On the other hand, I get so cynical about Christmas nowadays. Um, I don't want to talk too much about my thoughts on Christmas because that's just going to derail this video into a whole nother topic. But I, I guess just to summarize it briefly, I, I often feel like the stress of the holidays at Christmas brings about more trouble than they do, more trouble and stress than it does goodwill to men. I mean, I, I know it's supposed to be all about peace and goodwill to men, but like, if you've ever been at a shopping mall or worked at a shopping mall or worked anything in retail anytime towards Christmas, yeah, it, 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 it seems to bring out a lot of stress and it seems to bring out the worst in people. Um, but, you know, you go around telling people that you don't like Christmas, and they'll say, Oh, wow, you're a Scrooge, right? And I'm like, Ugh, I, I hate Dickens for writing that story. Uh, but then I actually read it, and I actually quite enjoyed that story. Um, which, and, you know, it's, it's one of these things, it's a classic for a reason. Um, for one thing, uh, I, I found myself quite sympathetic to Dickens' more liberal politics in this book. Uh, now, now Lincoln, Dickens was not a leftist by any stretch, and George Orwell has a good um, essay outlining Dickens' politics, which I'll try to remember to link in the description down below. Um, but Dickens was clearly on the side of the liberal reformers of his day. Uh, the publisher's introduction in this edition uh, sums up the theme of the story quite nicely. They say, the virtues of generosity and goodwill to all mankind, which are traditionally associated with Christmas, are presented as an antidote to the harsh Puritan attitude that prevailed in the world of Victorian trade. So Dickens' message of putting people before profit comes, quite, comes through quite clearly in his writing. 
When confronted with the doomed ghost of his old business partner, Jacob Marley, who is being punished in the afterlife for his greedy business practices, Scrooge says to him, But you are always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business." And I thought that was a very good point. Uh, true in Dickens' time and equally true in ours, when maybe we, were, we tend to... We tend to often think of, of a man's success based on his success uh, as a businessman. Uh, at other points, the miserly Scrooge, and this is kind of before his redemption, uh, sounds very much like today's Gingrich-esque conservatives, complaining about the lazy poor people on welfare. Uh, th there's a part in the beginning of the book when Scrooge is asked to give money to the poor, uh, and Scrooge has the following response. Uh, so quoting from the book, uh, the man says, All, sorry, at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common ne necessaries, Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses? demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had, had occurred to stop them in their usual course, said Scrooge. I am very glad to hear it. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. Uh, now, b besides the, the rather on-the-nose uh, condemnation of this uh, conservative attitude, conservative, uncharitable attitude towards the poor. Besides that, I also found myself getting drawn into the drama of Scrooge's life as the spirits take him back and forwards in time to show him what his life used to be like and what his future will be. The reader feels, along with Scrooge, the intense sorrow of the relationships he's lost in the past and the happiness that could have been his. Some of this actually reminded me a little bit of Citizen Kane. Uh, Scrooge starts out as a poor child with nothing, goes to be a hard-working young man, becomes obsessed with money and success, and loses track of what's important in life, and then is seemingly fated to die alone. Uh, but unlike Citizen Kane, Scrooge is given a chance to change his fate and to rejoin humanity. It's true that this story uses Christmas as a setting, but the actual really appealing parts of the story have nothing at all to do with Christmas. The story could easily have been rewritten without Christmas altogether. Uh, just Scrooge realizing that uh, what he thought was important, uh, the pursuit of work and money, uh, was actually not at all what was important in life. In fact, it is the Christmas sections of this story that are the weakest. I'm not sure if Dickens amplified the importance of Christmas because he thought it would make his story more popular, 
or if he really believed what he wrote. But the Christmas sections are pretty over the top. Dickens seems to believe that without Christmas, society would completely collapse. And yet, plenty of societies have gotten around, along fine without Christmas. Uh, you know, in China they went centuries without Christmas and didn't have any problems. At, at one point, the ghost of Christmas present uh, takes Scrooge around the world to show Scrooge that Christmas is being celebrated everywhere even down in the mines and in, and in the middle of the ocean and ships. Now I'm reading this, uh, and I'm reading this in Asia at the time, and I'm thinking, well, it's, okay, fine, it's, Christmas is being celebrated everywhere in the West, but it's not being celebrated everywhere. And I think, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna shift position. I think that was especially true uh, in the 19th century. Uh, you know, I mean, um, when Dickens was writing, Nowadays, if you go to Tokyo, they have Christmas decorations up in the middle of Tokyo in December. Uh, they don't really celebrate Christmas um, the way we do in the West, but they have the superficial trappings of it, the, the Christmas decorations. But that's nowadays with globalization. Back in Dickens' day, I, I don't think that was true at all. I don't think they, they even knew what Chris, Christmas was uh, in half the globe. But, the charms of the story overall are more than enough to make up for its excessive zeal about Christmas. Now, according to the publisher's introduction, after the success of A Christmas Carol, it became Dickens' tradition to publish a Christmas-themed story every year. And two others are included in this anthology, The Goblins Who Stole a Sexton and The Haunted Man and the Ghost Bargain. These stories are very similar in theme and in plot to A Christmas Carol. And when they're included in the same book, they can quickly start to feel repetitive. By the time I got to the end of the third story about ghosts showing a man the error of his ways on Christmas, I had just about lost my patience for the formula. But that's the problem with an anthology. I mean, D Dickens never intended for all these stories to be included in one anthology together. Dickens intended them to come out every year at Christmas. So, but, you know, you, you weren't intended to read them all at the same time. Because, of, of course, you're going to get sick of the same formula when you read it together. Uh, if, if you had been in Dickens' time and you've just been reading one of these a year, I, I'm sure it, w it would have worked a lot better. Okay, so I promised I would uh, save my example of Dickens' long descriptions till the end. This is the opening paragraphs from The Haunted Man and The Ghost Bargain. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to quote these opening paragraphs because I think they illustrate so perfectly Dickens' verbose style. Um, so if you like this, there's a lot more where this came from. If you're like me and you find this a little bit of a slog to get through, be forewarned, maybe, before checking out this book. So, quoting. Everybody said so. And sorry, this is, this is the, the absolute beginning of the book. Sorry, the, the beginning of the story. So, so you're, you're, you're missing nothing. This is how it starts out. Everybody said so. Far be it from me to assert that what everyone says must be true. Everybody is often as likely to be wrong as right. In the general experience, everybody has been wrong so often, and it has taken, in most instances, such a weary while to find out how wrong, that the authority is proved to be infallible. Everybody may sometimes be right, but that's not the rule as the ghost of Giles Scrogan says in the ballad. The dread word ghost recalls me. Everybody said he looked like a haunted man. The extent of my present claim for everybody is that they were so far right. He did. Who could have seen his hollow cheeks, his sunken, brilliant eye, his black attired figure, indefinably grim, although well-knit and well-proportioned, 
his grizzled hair hanging like tangled seaweed about his face, as if he had been, through his whole life, a lonely mark for the chafing and beating of the great deep of humanity, but might have said he looked like a haunted man. Who could have observed his manner, taciturn, thoughtful, gloomy, shadowed by habitual reserve, retiring always, and jocund never, with a distraught air of, reser of reverting to bygone places and times, or of listening to some old echoes in his mind, but might have said it was the manner of a haunted man. Who could have heard his voice, slow speaking, deep and grave, with a natural fullness and melody in it, which he seemed to set himself against and stop, but might have said it was the voice of a haunted man? Who that had seen him in his inner chamber, part library and part laboratory, for he was, as the world knew, far and wide, a learned man in chemistry, and a teacher on whose lips and hands a crowd of aspiring ears and eyes hung daily. Who that had seen him there upon a winter night, alone, surrounded by his drugs and instruments and books, the shadow of his shaded lamp, a monstrous beetle on the wall, motionless among a crowd of spectral shapes, raised there by a flickering by the flickering light of the fire upon the quaint objects around him. Some of these phantoms, the reflection of glass vessels that held liquids, trembling at heart like things that knew his power to uncombine them and to give back their component parts to fire and vapor. Who that had seen him then, his work done, and he pondering in his chair before the rustic grate and red flame, moving his thin mouth as if in speech, but silent as the dead, would not have said that the man seemed haunted in the chamber too. Who might not, by a very flight of fancy, have believed that everything about him took this haunted tone, and that he lived on haunted ground. His dwelling was so solitary and vault-like, an old retired of an ancient endowment for students, once a brave edifice planted in an open place, but now the obsolete whim of forgotten architects. Smoke age and weather darkened, squeezed on every side by the overgrowing of the great city, and choked like an old well with stone bricks its small quadrangles lying down in, very, in, in the very pits formed by the streets and buildings, which, in the course of time, had been constructed above its heavy chimney stacks, its old trees insulted by the neighboring smoke, which dined to droop so low when it was very feeble, and the weather very moody, its grassy plots struggling with the mildewed earth to be grass, or to win any show of compromise, its silent pavements, unaccustomed to the tread of feet and even to the observation of eyes, except when a stray face looked down from the upper world, wondering what nuke it was, its sundial a little bricked up corner where no sun had straggled for a hundred years, but where in compensation for the sun's neglect the snow would lie for weeks when it, lay, when it lay nowhere else, and the black east wind would spin like a huge humming top when in all other places it was silent and still. His dwelling at its heart and core, within doors at his fireside, was so lowering and old, so crazy, yet so strong, with its worm-eaten eaten beams of wood in the ceiling, and its sturdy floor shelving downward to the great oak chimney pieces, so environed and hemmed in by the pressure of the town, yet so remote in fashion, age, and custom, so quiet, yet so thundering with echoes when a distant voice was raised or a door was shut, Echoes not confined to the many low passages and empty rooms, but rumbling 
and grumbling till they were stifled in the heavy air of the forgotten crypt where the Norman 